Uh, this particular disc is about uh, Grata Scaloria, about the cave, and about the excavations, and about the publication. As you see from this little uh, introductory uh, slide, it was discovered in 1931, some preliminary work uh, undertaken in, in, in 31, 32, and published in 36 in a very short report. Then years went by, of course, the Second World War, and there was another uh, exploration in 1967. But mainly what we're going to talk about is what we found at, with the UCLA University of Genoa excavation, which took place in 1978, 1979, and in 1980 there was a study season which I co-directed with Maria Gimbutas in southeast Italy in the city of Manfredonia. Then uh, uh, the two principal investigators, Santo Tine of the University of Genoa and Maria Gimbutas at UCLA, went their separate ways and they never really fully, uh, fully finished uh, the publication. And so in, 19, in 2007, John Robb came to UCLA. He teaches at Cambridge in England. He gave a talk and then he came into my laboratory and said that he would be more than happy to help me in any way he could because the Italians were expecting me to publish Scaloria. As it happened, Maria had passed away just before the turn of the century. So we were starting a new century, the 21st century, and many, many years had passed since they had closed this excavation. So obviously it was going to be an excavation of an excavation. And so it began. And this is the year 2016. The publication is out and published and in the public realm. And, um, but I am preparing this because I thought that for those of you who are not in the world of academia, that very large tone might be a bit sort of off-putting. So you'll have this to tell you about all these years that I've been saying, I'm sorry I can't do this or I can't do that because I've been working on this. So about Scaloria Cave. And the cave is where you see Man Manfredonia close to the Adriatic coast with a little blue, uh, I guess that little, little blue pin on it. That's <clears throat> where the cave is. And you see there's Rome, there's the peninsula, and that little, that other peninsula, it's called the Gargano Peninsula, that's quite important in terms of the cave. In this case, now you see this and the, the parts of this area that we've numbered, number one is the Tavolieri Plain. It's one of the most important uh, wheat growing areas in southeast Italy. And uh, number two is where the cave is. It's as the plain rises to meet the Gargano Peninsula. And uh, number three is, is where there are flint mines at the edge of the Gargano Peninsula. Quite important, very early. I think some of the dates are 7,000, 6,000 BC. Flint being a very important raw material. Number four is the city of Manfredonia, which is where we were. We were living in a funny little hotel and where we did the study of the materials in the Manfredonia Museum. Number five shows you the entire province of Puglia, which is right there in southeast Italy. Number six, the, the, the arrow points to the island of Havar, which is part of what was once the Yugoslavia. And Havar has some of the raw material from the flint mines, so obviously there was a lot of, of uh, traffic going across the sea even as early as 7,000 and probably earlier. Number seven are the little Tremiti Islands, where there also is not only the flint, but some pottery from the mainland. <clears throat> the, the cave, which is where the largest of the round red circles are, uh, also probably had some connection with 
these little Neolithic villages, which are mostly in the Tavolieri Plain. They're called the Villaggi Trincerati because they're, they're all surrounded by um, ditches. And uh, maybe the ditches were sort of like we would have walls or fences. And the villages inside were not very large, although one or two were extremely large. But probably some of the people who lived in these villages did indeed use the cave, as we'll see. So here is the Tavolieri Plain. You see it's quite agricultural. And on the right hand, just as the right hand corner of that particular image, it is the beginning of the Gargano Peninsula. It's mountainous, but not very high. And the other image on the right hand side in the upper right indicates a change in this in the shoreland shoreline because during the time that the cave was occupied the the shore was quite farther away than it is now now the water has in, has sort of uh, come further up upon the land but what what it did in prehistory it did provide for different kinds of animals and plants for um, exploitation. And there you see where the arrow is, that's where the, 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 where the cave is. It's very close to, to, that shore, to that shoreline area. Well, in 1980, when I was there, there was a very new entryway. It's a gate, but not for us to go through. This was more or less the gate that the um, uh, that the uh, pipe company had provided. You see, the original discovery of the cave came when some men were sent to provide to dig out an area for a large uh, water pipe to bring water from Manfredonia to the little villages in the Gargano Peninsula. And some of these huge boulders couldn't be moved, so they set explosives. And when the smoke cleared, there was, a, there was an interesting crevasse into which one of the men jumped and discovered that it had skeletons and lots of pottery. They brought the archaeologists in. This was 1931. They didn't realize it was a double-chambered cave, but they did take out a lot of pots from the upper chamber and probably moved quite a few of the skeleton remains as well. So that was when they first discovered it. So it was discovered by surprise. And um, now, when UCLA began working there, we cleared away some of the debris with some of this earth-moving equipment. In the background, in the middle, there's a woman in a blue top. That's Maria Gimbutas. And then over here, uh, the man in the base uh, slacks is Santo Tine from the University of Genoa. And the other people are part of the early crew uh, at the very beginning in 1978. And this, this is where they, they began to do their excavation. Before going into the cave, they wanted to see if perhaps outside the cave there had been some evidence of occupation, that people might be living outside the cave and using the cave for whatever uh, activities. And so this sort of rest, resting crew, had, and you see all those barrels, they had been working right there to see what was outside. Now here's when we enter the cave. This is the way in which the, the, uh, the cave was entered in 1978. It was very tricky because you, you would sort of hang down on a rope and then you jump down into it. But you see this, the way the landscape is, it wasn't easy. So they, they opened it and then they shored it up. And the man with the mustache is named Nicola Leone and he is sort of the He's been watching over the cave for many years, and he also is a speleologist, you know, somebody who likes to explore in caves. The arrow shows you how this part now opened up to allow you to go down. And now this is a, a plan of the cave. Where that work was is right here. This is the central chamber, the upper chamber. This is the lower chamber which wasn't discovered until 1967. 
and this is called Occhio Pinto. This is, or this is a part of the cave uh, system that has never really been fully explored. But it might be, they probably will do more work in it in another year or two. This is where UCLA began to work in 1978 and also to explore more in the lower chamber. And the lower chamber was not discovered until Nicola Leone, this man whom I showed you in the, in the other slide, he and his young friends, it was 1967, uh, found a passage into the cave and discovered that there was a lower chamber and brought up some of the pots, which then came to the attention of Santo Tine, who was then with the superintendents yeah, in Manfredonia. He realized they were Neolithic pots. He called the young men in, and then he got a regular speleological team, and they began to go into the cave in 1965, 66, and 67. These are the squares that UCLA excavated. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. This was that little area outside where you saw those people taking a break, and this would be the passage that would go into the lower cave. And as you see, uh, it, it indicates the size, 30 by 80, and it's a sloping chamber. It was, it was, it was closed by collapse, probably a landslide or maybe an earthquake, in, and it wasn't opened until 1931 when it was opened, surprisingly, when they had put up the uh, explosives to move the boulders while they were preparing to put up the, the pipeline. And you see here the trenches and the radiocarbon dates and the indication of how a lot of skeletal remains. This is what it looked like. It's a mix, mix, mix. I mean, there's some pottery in here, so some broken bones, some animal bones, some human bone. That's a piece of pottery. And, and you can see what a commingling is what we call it. Here was a larger pot all smashed. And eventually, we were able to establish this set of grids, which is the way you always dig anyway up outside. But this was very difficult because the lighting. The lighting was affected if there were electrical storms. So often, we wouldn't have light at all. <clears throat> the, uh, the skeletal material that came from the upper chamber indicated that there, at least there were one or two uh, full skeletons that seem to be in that anatomical position, and there's the crania. But most of the skeletal material was mixed, as if it, as if the human had been disjointed. And you can see these cut marks because every single uh, one of the human bone was looked at very carefully under a microscope. We were interested to see. If, if they were defleshing the bones, or if there was any kind of, um, if there was any suggestion of any other kind of strange rite. And it turned out that essentially what was going on was that they were mainly uh, removing the soft tissue from the, the, the crania and from the face. Now, uh, when I began uh, with John Robb and some other scholars from Italy to go over this material, we realized <clears throat> that we needed to get some more information because this was the year we had already entered the 21st century. And so we asked, uh, we brought in some micromorphologists. They went down and they looked at the way in which the cave had formed. And as you see, and they found deposits of sheep goat dung in the entrance, which suggested that maybe there were some sheep and goat obviously being kept in that area. But they also described hearths and lots of trampling, just as the way in which those that mess looked like when you looked at the, at the floor. So pretty much they decided that the upper cave was used for habitation since it had hearths, evidence of sheep, goat, dung, as well as the, quote, burial. They saw that the, this had collapsed, the entrance, probably, 
and here they found a lot of human bone, and they also could tell about the development of the stalactites or stalagmites. This is the area that they had looked at. And now here's the lower chamber, which you could only reach by sort of crawling down that very tortuous passageway. But once you got there, it was quite fascinating with the stalactites hanging from the ceiling and the stalagmites growing up from the floor. There were many pools of water. There was a lot of dripping. Oh, that's one of the pools of water. There was a lot of dripping of... Um, of the stillicide water, and this particular pool seemed to have been carved in a kind of a rectangular shape. And as you see, well, there's our lantern, but these other pieces are, are stalagmites, and they, and they litter the floor, just litter the floor. Of course, lots of pots that were kind of cemented to the, to the uh, floor by that stillicide could when it when it dries um, it was really quite a uh, a challenging sight and here this is the very end of the lower chamber and we had asked some we had arranged for some divers to go into it to see if there was anything in the that had been thrown in there but also you can see the change in water the height of the water over time. And here you see where the, the divers were, but nothing was found. The water w covered nothing. Well, so of course we did quite a, we were able to do a lot of radiocarbon dates, some of which were done with the collagen, human collagen from some of the human bone. And um, this is something that shows uh, the relationship between whatever happened in the cave, uh, what kind of pottery styles we found, and what was going on in some of the other sites in those encircled villages on the Tavolieri Plain. And this indicates the ditched villages close by, Ripatetta, Guadone, Scamuso, Rendina. And uh, as, as time goes on, larger villages were formed but, um, and so they're a little bit later, about a thousand years later, and the ditched villages are occupied only until about, I'd say, 5000 BC. So we have radiocarbon dates that go back to about 6200 BC. And all in all, the main activity in the cave took place between 5600 and 5300. So there were 300, 300 really tight uh, during which the cave was was being used quite a bit, maybe uh, for certainly for ritual and also for some daily kinds of activities. And um, <clears throat> and by 5300 BC, maybe the uh, there had been another earthquake because. We don't, we don't have really many radiocarbon dates much later than that. Uh, we, this was important because they were so early, 11, these were, they were, these were four uh, what seemed to be upper Paleolithic, late upper Paleolithic, not really Mesolithic occupation of the trench. But it likely that the cave was used then for refuge from bad weather or something like that because there wasn't anything really found with with the, this evidence. So remember I talked about the flint mines on the Gargano coast. This is, you can see where Grotto Scaloria is, Manfredonia and some of these other sites. And um, there is the coast in, in a little bit uh, enlargement and where some of the mines are. The idea is that the flint from the mines would be taken out and put on some kind of a barge and and would be floated around the coast to Manfredonia. Then it could be uh, used by many of the sites on the on the Tavolieri Plain, uh, Grata Scaloria, or some of the sites 
uh, across the peninsula going farther north, where a lot of it is found. But <clears throat> the idea of sailing or floating on barges is an interesting one because I think that these the men would have the men who were the sailors would have to know a lot about the tides. They'd have to know about the the wind, the stars, the oh, the weather, and I think they did. I think this whole idea of how the trade went on from that part of uh, the coast of the Gargano was very interesting because there have been some explorations inside the Gargano itself, and it is possible that the herders would have taken their animals into the Gargano for the cooler weather and the higher elevations in the summertime. And there they may have had some connection with the miners. So perhaps they traded some of their animals with some of the flint. So that's another possibility. And this is what it looks like. That honey brown color is a very homogeneous uh, material and it makes for a very fine edge. Then there's some others, such as this, uh, almost a creamy gray color from probably one of the other mines. Here they use, use they call this a burin because it's used on that edge. And here's these other colors. Not all of them are from the mines though, because there are some flint that comes from boulders and and uh, sometimes it's found in the river, in the river banks, just cobbles. But the colors are quite fascinating. And these, this is a raw material which is, which forms a very good cutting edge or scraping edge. But the sharpest material for cutting is of course obsidian, but it comes from across the Italian peninsula from the island of Lipari, which is not far from Sicily, so it's a long way for it to have come. And so we don't find very much obsidian. There is a closer source called Palmarola, but curiously, the obsidian that's been tested from sites <clears throat> on the Tavolieri or in Abruzzi, which is just north of Puglia, most of that comes from Lipari, not from Palmarola. It, and it suggested that most of these did come from from uh, Lipari. And though this slide isn't very clear, the edges were very fine. And this is the sort of tool that would have been used if you were taking some flesh or if any bones on any of the crania or any of the other parts of the body. These were very fine looking ground and polished green stone. And its sources, I don't think that's been decided yet, it's somewhere in the Italian peninsula, which means that it had been traded. But obviously it didn't have much use. None of these show a lot of use. So they must have been prized possessions. And they did interesting work. Uh, uh, bone needles, some sort of sewing, and this wonderful carved boar canine. There were two of them. This one is sort of in a... Uh, a herringbone pattern, and then there's a little hole at the at the stub end, so it could have been used hanging as a decoration, or it was somebody's prized possession. But you can see there was a lot of work put into that carving. Of course, there are lots and lots of pottery, pottery, stone tools, bone tools. Uh, human bone, animal bone, and pottery. So the, the upper left is some of the earliest pottery, and then the right is the red over cream, and then underneath that, that's the later pottery. Those are kind of abstract animals under the rim. And then the pottery, which has several colors, red, black, on cream. Very, very interesting patterns. And the red, the red on buff here, and then some string impressed. So 
uh, in Italy they have a very careful chronology uh, of, of their Neolithic settlements and pottery all has names relating to where the majority of it and where it's first found, as these would too. Now there was a lot of work done on what they might have been eating since we had all the human bone. And there, the, uh, I, there's a lot, lots of work now that couldn't have been done when it was first excavated in 1978 and 79, has to do with isotopic analysis. And as, as we print here, tooth dentine reflects intake at the time of death. And the enamel reflects a diet and the first years of an individual's life. So there's the, uh, the scholars who study this look at the relationship among the different isotopes. Then they decide exactly what the diet was. And in this case, vegetable protein, and those are the beans, uh, that was quite, that was quite important. Very little, uh, very little animal protein was, uh, was used in the Neolithic diet. And that's curious. Maybe it was because animals were more social valuables rather than food. But the use resources were questionable. Although they were close to the, to the Adriatic Sea, there wasn't a lot of what is called a marine signal in the human bone. We don't know why. Was it taboo? Did they not have a sufficient labor organization? And yet at another site, Masseria Candelaro, not far, two scholars, Cassano and Manfredini, found evidence of all these oyster shells. So, Obviously, uh, the oyster shells, the oysters were being harvested. So we come to the end now. This was a meeting that we had in Cambridge. And so sitting next to me is Eugenia Isetti. And there's John Robb, Christopher Knusel, who worked with John in the isotopic studies and the looking at each piece of bone to see where the incisions were and the last person is a young uh, graduate student who did the report on the um, on the bone tools. And over here, uh, the first person in pink is Tamsin O'Connell, and she's uh, from Cambridge, and she supervised all the isotopic studies. Antonella Traverso is from Genoa, and she, along with Eugenia, were and John. We four form the editorial board, and they spent many days in Manfredonia going through the storage rooms of the museum in Manfredonia, and then in Foggia, and in Taranto. And the young woman with the long blonde hair is one of John Robb's students. Now she's professor in Rome, and she did a lot of the work with, uh, with Tamsin O'Connell on the isotopic studies. The last person in the blue blouse with a big smile is Patricia Garibaldi, who is the director of the Liguria Museum, which is in, in Genoa. And she wrote an article, one of the articles with um, Eugenia, on the uh, ground stone tools. So all of these people came to the meeting that we called in, um, in Cambridge. It was sort of the last editorial meeting before we, we went for publication. And uh, here's how, how the landscape looks now. You see in the back, in the, in, it, at the end of the slide, the rear of the slide rather, is the beginning of the Gargano Massif. So it doesn't show you how the cave is really on a rise, but it is. And this is now a bigger kind of an opening that was left by the, the people who are in charge of the water pipe. And the, the, the cave opening that we have is not in this particular picture. But this is the way the landscape uh, looks. And you can see that there was a lot growing here. It's been plowed. So we, we say goodbye to Scaloria Cave, thank the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology at UCLA, and the uh, 
the National Endowment for the Humanities who provided uh, me with the grant so we could do all the things we did. And the Instituto Italiano per l'Archeologia Sperimentale in Genoa at the University, from which the Italian uh, Eugenia and Antonella were associated, and the John Robb and um, <coughs> Tamsin O'Connell and uh, Marianne Tufuri. And finally, Opus Archive Pacifica Graduate Institute in California where Maria Gimbutas had archived her papers, which we were able to obtain because of their generosity. They allowed us to take all these papers and slides, copy the slides on long-term loan. So we thank them and all the, other, all the other institutions who helped us and supported us during these many years while, while we got the excavation. Uh, ready for publication. And now here's the book, The Archaeology of Grotta Scaloria, Ritual, Neolithic Southeast Italy. Our, our ideas now is that the cave was used for ritual for, uh, for, sent, for putting in all of these, these bodies which had been defleshed and also for some kind of uh, ritual involving holy water in the lower chamber where all of the pools of water were uh, and continued to uh, drip from the stalactites. So here, you, this was taken not during the time of the excavation, but uh, at the more recent re uh, investigation by the micromorphologist and John Robb and a few others. And here we have um, Maria Gimbutas and Santo Tine, the joint directors of the UCLA Coatsen Institute of Archaeology, University of Genoa, Scaloria Project, the, unfortunately both of whom are no longer with us, but we dedicate the book to their, to their memory. Uh, they started the project and we finished it, and I think we're both, <laughs> we're all quite pleased. So that's it. Thank you. And my name is Ernestine S. Elster, and this is the year 2016.